Welcome back to the program, you beautiful people. My name is Dr. Dan. I am a pharmacist turned obesity expert. And well, today we're going to talk again about Saxenda. And that's just because I kind of went down a little rabbit hole and did all the learning around it. And here we are. So when it comes to medications, particularly if you're looking on social media and the internet, people tend to focus on the negatives, which rightly so. Some medications can certainly have some negative side effects. And yeah, there's definitely been lots of medications over the years that have come to market. And after being out and available to the public for a period of time, they've been ultimately pulled due to some kind of side effect. And certainly the weight loss obesity medications are no different. And in case you're wondering, I have discussed many of the potential side effects and things to be thinking about when it comes to drugs like Wagovi, Sexend, and Contrave. You can check them all out in my videos down below. And while the weight loss medications, the only thing really anybody talks about is the weight loss benefit of it, I want to do something a little bit different and focus a bit on what are some of the other benefits to a drug like Saxenda outside of weight loss. In particular, can Saxenda protect our hearts? So let's get into it. But before we get too deep, of course, we have the usual housekeeping. You got to hit the subscribe button down below so that you don't miss another episode. As well, I want you to check me out on my other channels at the official Dr. Dan. We're on the tick, the talk, the gram, you name it, we are out there. And I'm doing weekly lives every single Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, both here on YouTube and on my TikTok channel. And of course, if you feel like you need some additional support on your weight management journey, check out my website, healthevolved.co. Again, that's healthevolved.co. O is in orange, and you can book a consultation with myself. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Saxenda helps with weight and weight loss, and being fat is bad for your health, so it kind of makes sense that it would help your heart. No? And this may be partially true, absolutely, but there might be more to that story. To help with our discussion a little bit, we are going to review another scientific trial, as always, and it's called The Leader Trial by Marceau and Friends. As just like a real quick aside here, just like super tiny if you will, the molecule that is found in the Saxenda pens is called Lyra glutide. That is the same molecule that is also found within the pens called Victoza. Now, it's exactly the same drug. The only difference is, is Victoza is indicated for diabetes management to a dose of 1.8 milligrams per day, whereas Saxenda is indicated for obesity management to a dose of 3 milligrams per day. I know, do not worry if you get confused because same. Same. Anywho, the LEADER trial was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that was looking to answer one question specifically. And that question was, in real sciencey terms, was in patients that have type 2 diabetes, does liraglutide, or Victoza slash Saxenda, affect cardiovascular mortality, non-fatal myocardial infarctions, or non-fatal strokes when compared to a placebo. Now, the simpler English translation is, in individuals that have diabetes, does liraglutide slash saxenda slash victoza increase, decrease, or have a neutral effect when it comes to heart attacks, strokes, or death that is due to a cardiovascular or a heart-related cause when we compare it to a placebo sample. I, I know, the, the science world, we, we like to complicate things, if you will. Anywho, so in the trial, Marceau and friends found about 9,300 individuals that had type 2 diabetes as distinguished with an A1C that was greater than 7%. And for those of you that don't know, A1C is kind of like your three-month average of what your blood sugar is over a period of time, over three months. And if it's over 7%, you are considered to have uncontrolled type 2 diabetes. Now, these individuals also already had a high risk of heart disease or had already experienced some kind of heart disease event, such as a previous heart attack, stroke, and that sort of thing. To give you like a little bit more of a breakdown, a portion of the patients were older than 50 years old, but they had to have had some kind of heart disease event, so the heart attack, stroke, that sort of thing. And the other participants were over 
over 60 years old, but they had to have some kind of risk factor for heart disease. And these kind of things might be like, you know, they have hypertension or high blood pressure, they might have some protein in their urine so their kidneys aren't functioning 100%, or perhaps they have some kind of dysfunction in their heart's pumping ability. So hopefully with that information, you can possibly see, do you fit within the individuals that were included in this trial? As you probably saw, age is definitely a risk factor for an increased risk of heart disease, hence why we only brought in people that were 60 years and over and had some kind of heart disease risk factor versus the individuals that are 50 and over and actually have heart disease at this present time. Age, unfortunately, is kind of the ultimate determinant that we really can't do anything about because we all just get older every minute, every second, all the minutes you're watching this video, if you will. And as we get older, the diseases that we can potentially develop, the risk of them increases over time. And this is even if you are doing everything perfectly. It's kind of like when you buy a new car and how as soon as you drive it off the lot, that car starts to depreciate in value. Well, the same kind of thing happens with our bodies over time in that we're continuously breaking down, getting older, and things are just not going to function as well as time goes on. And as another aside, if you happen to be interested in what your risk of heart disease is currently, you can go to CVD, C is in car, V is in Victor, D is in Dan, calculator.com and you can input your various values. There's some lab values and stuff that you'll ultimately need and it'll punch out a rough estimate of what your current risk of a heart attack, stroke, or some kind of cardiovascular disease is at present. Now, I highly recommend that you follow up and review this with your healthcare provider as there is some info there that might not be able to interpret or what have you, but it is a great little calculator to determine what is your risk of heart disease. Now, you're probably wondering why I just went into so much detail around cardiovascular disease and the breakdown of the various people that were in this study, but I swear I have a point. Point number one here is that when we do some studies in this sense, we like to use individuals that are at a higher risk or are already experiencing the said disease so that when we compare our intervention, which is liraglutide or Victoza slash Sexenda in this case, to a placebo, there is a greater chance of us seeing some kind of benefit or not, or potentially some kind of harm. Now, the other point that I want to make here is that a trial that's looking at cardiovascular or heart disease outcomes generally is going to be about five years in length, right? Because not the whole pile of people are just having cardiovascular events left, right, and center. It's going to take some time to get some data or enough data to determine yay or nay if an event is happening more frequently or less frequently. And so when we are using individuals that are at a higher risk of an event, what that ultimately means is that we can use a smaller number of individuals because there's more likely going to be a chance that a greater portion of people are going to have that set event. And we can also make the trial a little bit shorter. That's all important because running these trials is hella expensive. Not only that, like in this trial, there was 93 participants included. Could you imagine trying to keep track of 10,000 people for over a five year period. I mean, I look at my friends who already have kids and the amount of time that they spend trying to follow around maybe one or two kids and prevent those said kids from killing themselves because kids have a lot of ways that they can potentially kill themselves, they are often exhausted with just that effort. Can you imagine trying to do that with 10,000 independently thinking adults? It's gonna be a hard no on that one for me. Anyways, that is enough about the details around the patient population and kind of some of the nitty gritty things that I think are really cool, but you probably think is pretty boring. But nonetheless, we are going to now dive into a little bit of the meat and potatoes of this study. What Marceau and friends did is they took these 9,300 individuals and they split them up into two groups. One group got Victoza or Liraglutide and were titrated to a dose of 1.8 milligrams once per day. And the other group got a very similar looking pen, but they were injecting a placebo or essentially sugar water. Both of these groups continued on with their usual care. So they continued to go see their family doctor. The family doctor would assess their blood sugars and all the various other things would add and take away medications as they needed and, that, and saw fit, and the participants would continue to come into the clinic for further follow-ups to you know, get their weight, their 
blood pressure, blood sugars, all those wonderful things completed. Ultimately, the goal was to get these individuals A1C, so that three month average of their blood sugar, to be less than 7%, so to be well controlled, if you will. They then followed these individuals from 42 to a maximum of 60 months, or for those of us that don't have toddlers or babies and, and use real actual time delineations and stuff, about three and a half to five years. And so Marceau and Pals was ultimately looking to see how many heart attacks, strokes, and deaths in the two groups ultimately occurred over that 42 to 60 month period. In the healthcare research world, we consider that a primary outcome and it's called a MACE outcome or major adverse cardiovascular events outcome. Basically what we do is we combine all of those various events that can potentially occur together in order to see if a harm is occurring from a cardiovascular standpoint with a drug or with a placebo or anything in between. Now the drug company Nova Nordisk, the company that makes Victoza or Liraglutide, their main hope from this trial was that liraglutide was shown to be no more harmful or did not lead to more MACE events when compared to the placebo. Ultimately, a neutral result would be a fantastic result. So basically the placebo and liraglutide would be exactly the same. An even better result would be that the placebo had more events occurring compared to liraglutide because that would indicate that liraglutide or Victoza has maybe a protective effect or reduces that risk of events. What Marceau and friends ultimately found was that 13% of the individuals or about 608 individuals in the liraglutide or Victoza group experienced a MACE event. Whereas in the placebo group, 14.9% or about 694 individuals experienced a MACE event. So it's clear not only did liraglutide or Victoza lead to like a neutral result in that it was no worse than placebo, but it also might have been a smidge better than the placebo group. So it may have had this protective effect in terms of cardiovascular heart outcomes. Now to try and give you a bit more perspective, you can kind of think of it like if we took 66 individuals that were essentially the same as the individuals in this trial, so they had a high risk of cardiovascular disease or have already had a cardiovascular event, we took 66 people, we gave them all liraglutide or Victoza for at least a three year period. Out of that 66 people, there would be one person that would have a reduction in MACE events. Everyone else may very well have a MACE event, but we would need to treat 66 people for just one person to ultimately have that reduced risk. I know what you're saying, that really doesn't sound all that great, one in 66, what exactly is the point? But when we extrapolate that to a larger population scale, yeah, that result gets pretty good. Now, unfortunately, when we look at individuals that say don't have diabetes or aren't at a high risk of cardiovascular disease, we're gonna to need to treat even more of them in order to get a reduction in MACE events. So it's kind of a diminishing return, but that wasn't the main aspect of this trial we were trying to figure out. What we were ultimately trying to see is just that the drug liraglutide was no worse than the placebo, which it definitely showed. We now have some data to show that liraglutide or Victoza up to a dose of 1.8 milligrams at the very least does not increase your risk of heart disease or a heart related event. And it may provide some benefit in that regard of things as well. And unfortunately, we don't have any trials at present and probably won't ever have any trials done with liraglutide up to three milligrams per day in individuals that don't have diabetes and just say have obesity. So I unfortunately don't have any good numbers to throw at you in terms of if you don't have diabetes and you're just using it for weight management to that higher dose, are you ultimately going to get a cardiovascular benefit? What I can tell you fortunately is they are doing those kinds of trials with drugs like Wagovi up to its max dose of 2.4 milligrams once per week in individuals that only have obesity and don't have diabetes. 
So we should get some very interesting results from that perspective of things. And of course, when that trial comes out, I will be sure to let you know. Now, an interesting aspect of this study is there wasn't a huge difference in terms of blood sugar control or even in terms of weight loss occurring between the two groups. Obviously, liraglutide did have a little bit better results, but it really wasn't a whole pile of difference overall. And so if that's the case, well, how again does Saxenda or liraglutide potentially provide benefit to the heart if it's not promoting that much weight loss or blood sugar control? Well, you see, interestingly enough, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, and in particular in this study, may also have an effect in terms of managing blood pressure, so bringing your blood pressure levels down. It may also help with your cholesterol levels, and in particular bringing your bad cholesterol, LDL, down a little bit. When LDL levels are high, that can ultimately clog up your arteries and lead to a heart attack. So if we're lowering that level, well, then we're gonna get the benefit of less clogging. And finally, these medications might have a benefit on our platelets. Now, if you don't know what your platelets are, if you've ever cut yourself or got a scratch or something like that and a scab is ultimately formed, that's because of your platelets. They're kind of the clot forming guys, if you will. And so just like you can get a scratch on your skin, you can also get scratches on the inside of your arteries. And those same clotting platelets can ultimately form a scab and they're trying to protect you, but sometimes they can get a little carried away and ultimately cause a blockage within your vessel. And so the GLP-1 medications might help to regulate those platelets and prevent them from leading to a larger clot development, ultimately reducing your risk of a cardiovascular event such as a heart attack or a stroke. I know, that's all pretty darn cool, right? Hopefully you found that interesting because I, I know I certainly did. I think it's super cool that these medications could potentially have a benefit outside of just regulating and helping with weight loss in terms of helping us manage cardiovascular disease and those sorts of things. Ultimately, what this means is that we can use these medications for different indications and different purposes because they're gonna have that extra added benefit outside of what maybe they were originally prescribed for. So, pretty darn cool if you ask me. Anyways, you beautiful people, that is it for today. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about a drug like Saxenda and how it can potentially help our heart and reducing our risk of various events and such like that. As always though, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below so that you don't miss another episode. As well, check me out on my other channels at The Official Dr. Dan and check out my website healthevolved.co and that is O as in orange. And finally, don't forget to check us out. We do a live every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So tune in, bring your questions, and I look forward to seeing you. Until next time, my friends, always remember, small tweaks lead to massive peaks.